Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Before we jump into today's episode, I want you to know something really important, which is that I love you. I really love you, and I'm so honored that you're tuning in today. I want you to take such good care of yourself. I want you to know at your core that you are someone worth taking care of, and I want you to put into practice the things that you already know to do to take care of yourself. I just wanted to get that off my chest because podcasting is a commitment. A lot of time and energy goes into it between the interviews and the production team. It, it, it's actually pretty expensive. And I've been doing it for over two years now, once a week. We just crossed a pretty impressive download threshold number. And I've just been reflecting back and feeling a huge heartfelt thanks to those of you who have been on this journey with me, especially to those of you who have told others about the show or left a review in Apple Podcasts or in iTunes. I so appreciate it. And if you haven't done either of those things, there's still time. I'd love for you to think of a, a three people that you know that could really benefit from this kind of information and maybe share an episode with them and invite them to well, join the mission of helping to create health, happiness, and personal evolution on the planet. Yeah, go team. I just got back from a super powerful week in Salt Lake City with my yoga health coaching tribe. Um, it wasn't exactly a retreat. It was more like an intensive on how to step into who we're becoming next as leaders and coaches. And considering how we evolve our personalities and our leadership styles to just go beyond what we're already good at. So a lot of the stuff we were doing, I felt like I've done this a million times before, like reflecting on my story and figuring out how to source power from the pain and looking at the shadow issues and figuring out where I'm making the same mistakes over and over again and maybe how to not do that. But there's really something to doing that in a group setting, which I wanted to share because a lot of people don't spend a lot of time in dynamic groups. And if you're someone who doesn't go on retreats or take workshops or, or join a, a group that's that's committed to evolution, you're really missing out on a lot of ease and accelerated progress and support and possibilities that can open you up to to just really getting you out of your box. So just like our usual bias of how we see the world and what we think we have to be struggling with or seeing as problems, it's not the only way of doing things. One of my teachers, Jeffrey Yuen, who I talk about frequently, the 88th generation Taoist master, he um, talks about teaching herbal medicine that you, in order to find out what an herb does, you don't just take it by itself and see what it does. You put it with other herbs and you see synergistically how they work, what properties they bring out of each other, and what of what maybe they help to mitigate. Like if if an herb has a really harsh property, another might make it not so bad. And what kind of what organ systems the herbs guide to in the body. And same thing with people. Like in order to find out who we are, you don't just go hang out with but yourself in a cave or on a mountaintop. You need other people for that. We need to bounce around and see what how we're different from each other and see our own uniqueness in a new way, as well as um, the uniqueness of others and be able to mirror that back to them. As we're really, we're all just facets of consciousness that, that are really unique um, reflections in each of us. So just like people in your life might see you in a particular context, like they might see you certain strengths of yours that come out at work, whereas people who know you socially or with your family see like a different side of you. Just being around different people allows us to show up differently. And that's actually really freeing because we, we need to express all aspects of who we are in order to feel whole. It's also a real opportunity to receive and this is something that I personally struggle with. I routinely brush off compliments or have historically brushed off compliments and deflected them and downplayed my own worth. And, and really it's, it's a way that I still feel like I play small. So I've been really consciously trying to not cut off the flow of nourishment from community and, and really just say thank you and really receive it and take it in. So being around my fellow coaches this past week, it was really interesting to notice the things that I was comfortable taking credit for versus the kinds of things that I that I was like, really? Wow, <laughs> you see that? Uh, because I realized that 
I've spent the past 20 years being super kind of incisive with my using my inquisitive mind like to ask potent questions and to get to the bottom of what's wrong with somebody's ecosystem like getting at the root cause of disease and I'm really good at that and I I can own the fact that I've worked damn hard to to be a good clinician. I've also spent that time of course doing things like meditating and doing yoga and doing qigong. And so I've cultivated that too, but when people give me feedback about what it's like to be around me, what it's like to be in my presence and to feel the love that comes from my eyes or to to see just by how I'm looking at someone, how deeply I'm listening or the, the kind of energy that I radiate, that felt really great to receive. And I'm saying this not to be like all braggy pants about it, but to really, to just get that we all really do need each other to see each other accurately and to be able to sometimes really own our strengths and how we're different, which is nourishing. And on the flip side, sometimes we forget that we have a bias. Like we have our beliefs about the way the world is or the way that we are or what a problem is in our lives. And what happens when other people witness how we speak to ourselves and how we act and how we carry ourselves when we're slumped over and when our face lights up and they're able to give us that feedback, it is a gold mine in getting us out of our bias and recognizing that, oh yeah, there's more than one way to do this. There's more than one way that I could be perceiving this. Um, as Anais Nin uh, wrote that, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. And recognizing that that our constitutional strengths of, of the way we're looking at the world or the way that we've practiced is not the truth of all that is. And sometimes it just takes that shift in perspective for us to recognize that, oh yeah, like that life could be a lot easier. Like the circle that we're, what we're aware of is really small compared to what we don't know about the world. And getting together with other people, there's this opportunity for the collective or the hive mind to introduce us to things that are beyond our current level of awareness. Like someone could say, Oh, that's what you're dealing with. You should read this book or you should meet this person. You really need to talk to so and so. Or there's this really cool app that could really help you with that some kind of system that is out there, but that hasn't reached your level of awareness. So just bouncing around with other people, it just broadens, it can accelerate our progress so much faster because we're able to get access to everybody else's resources and what everyone else has done. The other thing that really struck me is that things are not better when we keep them to ourselves. When we keep things a secret, well, I, as I mentioned, we, we did these reflection exercises that were really going into the shadow issues and bringing up stuff that we're not necessarily proud of or inclined to make public or the struggles that happen in private. And we were really challenged and encouraged to bring that to the forefront. And it was amazing how just like in a few hours, things that I thought like, oh, I'm never, huh, no one's going to know about this, were the things that I actually was ready to talk about and became actually not a big deal. And even having other people go, oh my God, me too. You you do that? I had no idea. I thought I was the only one. So it, there's just this really cool thing that that where the things that we're most ashamed of get witnessed and then they're no longer a source of shame. So I'm bringing this up for a few reasons. Um, it just that first of all, you could potentially do this with your friends, but it's also the kind of thing that you could join a dynamic group setting. And it's really in our culture, we're so used to this rugged individualism, this bootstrappiness of like hard work or, you know, that we're socialized to, to feel like we have to do it all ourselves. And what's on the other side of that limiting belief might be a whole lot of ease and a whole lot of freedom. Plus, in our society, we're also atomized. We're doing our own thing in our separate little houses and we're away from community and a lot of times away from family. And there's this deep need that we have, I think, of belonging and feeling connected. And one of my gifts and strengths is being able to create a sense of safety and belonging and an environment, a container, a strong container for people to get really transformative results in a relatively short amount of time. So I want to invite you, if this is something that's resonating with you and you're like, I want in on that, that 
I'm currently doing enrollment calls for my next round of Level Up and a new course called Inner Alchemy, which is available only to people who've done Level Up with me. So if you're listening now and you're curious and you're thinking that you would really like to go not only make progress on your health, but also on your personal development, maybe stop beating yourself up or get over your perfectionism or your people pleasing or whatever, a little box that you put yourself in that's preventing you from the fullness of who you could be. I would love for you to get a taste of what it's like to be part of a dynamic group. So two things you can do. One is you can join me in Mexico, February 16th through 23rd, 2019. It's just a few months away, and it's going to be an amazing transformative experience for the people that show up. We're going to do a deep dive into the Chinese elements and see ourselves as these different constitutional types, not to limit ourselves, but to see what the other types are like and what might it be like to play with different ways of navigating the world, not just the ones that we're really good at using. We're going to do this with embodiment practices because there's so it's, there's just a world of difference between getting something intellectually versus feeling it in your body and practicing engaging with others like that and having others be able to mirror that back to us. As much as I like leading retreats, I really don't like marketing them. So through November 10th, if you even tell someone else about this retreat, I will send you 50 bucks when they sign up. And if you have a friend and you both sign up together, you can both claim this offer. And I'll also send you a special gift. Okay, so I hope this was inspiring for you to get with your people, or if you if your people are not on a growth path, um, maybe upgrade your people or join me. Now on to today's episode. I'd like to extend to you an invitation to be coached by me for free. All you need to do is send in your question to Brody at BrodyWelch.com. That's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H, Brody at BrodyWelch.com. And let me know what your biggest struggle is right now regarding your mindset, your habits, your digestion or elimination or hormones or sleep or energy or whatever it is that you are struggling with with respect to your health, your happiness, or your personal evolution, all the things that I know something about and would love to help you with. Because if you're dealing with it and you bother to write in and tell me about it, it's likely that that's going to help at least a hundred other people who are wondering the exact same thing, but who are not going to act on it. So if you're ready for some one-on-one coaching, send in your question and I will choose one and air it on the podcast to be shared with our wonderful, loving, and supportive healthy curiosity audience. And if you're ready for some coaching and you don't want it aired publicly, you really belong in my level up group. So check it out at brodywelch.com. Okay. Welcome to a healthy curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch. And today's show is for you. If you have ever felt confused about what to put into your body, that will actually nourish you. It seems like there is so much noise out there as to whether foods are quote unquote good or bad. Gluten, for example, good, bad, who knows? Meat, saturated fat, cholesterol, grain. There's a lot of conflicting information and with me today to help clear up the food confusion that we are all swimming in is Dr. David Friedman. Dr. Friedman is an award-winning number one national best-selling author of Food Sanity. He's also a doctor of naturopathy, clinical nutritionist, and chiropractic neurologist. He has received postdoctorate certification from Harvard Medical School, is a former teacher of neurology, and is the author of the college textbook, Understanding the Nervous System. He has been a contributing writer to U.S. News and World Report, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, Healthy Living, Women's Day, and he hosts his own show called To Your Good Health Radio. He's heard it all. And so we're going to delve into fact from fiction around food. Dr. David Friedman, welcome to the show. Brody, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. First off, I'm curious what inspired you to write Food Sanity? Well, I wrote Food Sanity after really 18 years of frustration that I endured as a syndicated TV and radio health expert. I've interviewed literally hundreds of scientists and doctors, best-selling authors, and my goal was to share information to help my audience reach their optimal health. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Instead, every guest would contradict their previous expert, leaving everybody, including me, 
more confused. You got proponents of the vegan, the paleo, Mediterranean to gluten free, low carb diet. The opinions pretty much are different as night and day. And I remember oatmeal used to help balance blood sugar. Now we're told avoid grains because they spike our blood sugar. And coffee used to be considered unhealthy. Today we're told it helps prevent disease. And eggs used to cause high cholesterol for decades. We were told that now we're so told, hey, research shows eggs contain lecithin which lowers cholesterol. So after growing frustrated with all the conflicting opinions, I wrote Food Sanity. It breaks through all the facts, fads, and fiction and finally answers the big question, what are we supposed to eat? Right. Well, it sounds like a really impressive undertaking. I, I'm curious what you feel like is the biggest myth out there around food. Wow. There's quite a few of them. I th uh, one of them would be, I, I guess, Probably milk. You would need milk for strong bones. I mean, that's that's one that's for some reason people still believe this, even though the science shows it doesn't. We've been engraved with this billion dollar milk industry advertising campaign. And, you know, we're taught in, in when we're children that we need milk for strong bones. If we want to grow up big and strong, we need milk. But in fact, it's research shows milk's the contributing factor to the cause of brittle bones. <laughs> right. I remember reading that study about the correlation between dairy consumption and hip fractures. And I was like, huh. And then, and then my patient's saying, well, where are we supposed to get calcium? And it's like the answer being the same place the cows get there. Exactly. From leafy green stuff. Exactly. And you know, it's interesting before the milk goes to the grocery store, it's pasteurized. So meaning it's, exposed to extreme heat. And this heat process is required to destroy the bacteria, but it renders a lot of the calcium that's in milk insoluble. So it doesn't even, it's not even there anyway, but it, it's destroyed in the manufacturing process. But when I say that, people say, well, what if I can get unpasteurized milk? Would that work? It still wouldn't give you enough magnesium needed for your body to absorb the calcium. See the calcium to magnesium ratio in cow's milk is nine to one. 90% calcium, 10% magnesium. Most experts recommend having a ratio of one to one for bone, 50% magnesium, 50% uh, calcium. And guess where you get that from? As you mentioned, plants, you could find that in summer squash. You can find that in almonds and uh, sesame seeds. You can find that in spinach and kale. So you can get the perfect bone building magnesium calcium dynamic duo from plants. And of course, not just where cows get it from, strongest bones in the world is elephants. They don't mm -hmm. drink milk. Right, right. <laughs> Well, that's a great place to start, but great place to kick things off. What I'd like to do on the show today is take things section by section of the grocery store and figure out what do we avoid and what do we buy in each of those sections. Right. And also, I, I'd like to, us to get into weight loss because 70% of Americans are overweight right. and the deck is really stacked against us in terms of healthy eating and like you really have to opt out of the standard American diet if you're hoping to lose weight. And so right. let's actually start there first um, in terms of what are the contributing factors to obesity, including obesogens, as well as probably the most important foods we should avoid if we're interested in losing weight. Well, what's interesting, you know, when patients ask me, hey, oh, there's so many diets out there, which one works? And I usually shock them when I, my answer is they all work. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's eating for your blood type, Atkins, Paleo Zone, Keto, Nutrisystem, or Weight Watchers, if you follow the program, you're going to experience weight loss. Unfortunately, the results are usually temporary. And one of the main reasons why so many different diets initially work is because they have one thing in common. They change a person's routine. They promote eating different foods, different ways at different times. So whether that's eating great fruits or steak three times a day or changing your portion sizes or going vegan, when you mix up your daily routine, you're going to alter your metabolism, change your blood sugar levels, which in turn can lead to weight loss. The key is keeping it off and studies show 95% regain it and then some within a year. So in food sanity, I looked at the word diet for the true meaning of the word. It comes from the Greek word diatia, which means way of living. See, that's yes. the key mm -hmm. to achieving permanent weight loss. So I share how you got to get in touch with your, your way of living, but it's not just eating. That's important to achieve permanent weight loss. You got to have clean eating, avoid obesogens, which we can cover. That's the chemicals that cause weight gain and getting deep restorative sleep. That's the secret recipe for successful, here's the word, permanent weight loss, permanent. Mm -hmm. And to that, I would add uh, lining up your lifestyle so that it works with our biology in the way that it's supposed to work, um, exactly. the circadian medicine. So tell us about obesogens. Well, it's interesting, you know, with obese, that's probably the most common thing that I've been um, 
interviewed for my books about food, but it's not really about food that's the issue for weight gain. It's obesogens, which are found inside food, wrapped around our food, and even in the cook where we prepare our food on. So these are chemicals, and they disrupt our hormonal balance, increase our appetite, and actually increase the number of fat cells. And the average person is exposed to up to 100 obesogens every day. So it is truly the, the reason we can't lose the weight and keep it off. It's not about food because there's a lot of good food programs out there that will even deliver it to you. Certified organic fraction, you lose weight and three months later you plateau and four months, five months, you're gaining it back. It has to do with the probably the items you're cooking your food on, maybe what you're cooking your, uh, your, you know, your cookware, which is the nonstick cookware. And one of them is the biosphenol A, which is BPA. And we've always known that's bad for us in plastic, but research now shows it's contributing to weight gain. It increases insulin resistance, even linked to cancer. And this is found in like plastic food and beverage containers, canned foods, bottle tops. And it's also found, here's the key people don't realize, these thermal paper items like cinema tickets, ATM, credit card receipts, and airline tickets. So if you touch these receipts, you're contaminating your hands You put this receipt in your wallet, it makes you contact with your money, causes BPA contamination on your currency. So if they hand you that, put it in the bag. I mean, it seems like a relatively small amount of exposure. Like, is taking a receipt from a cashier really enough to do it? Yeah, according to the International Journal of Obesity, they found it doesn't take much, it's just parts per million that can disrupt your endocrine. And they've actually had studies showing that this BPA increases the number of fat cells you have. So we, always, we originally thought we were born with so many fat cells. This actually increases the number of fat cells. Hard enough to lose our own fat cells. We don't want any more. Right. <laughs> right. So yes, yeah, so studies show it does not take much to disrupt the hormones. And we're bombarded with so many of them. So BPA is just one small one. There's so many other ones, especially the PFOAs, which was interesting. I was just on Fox News and I talked about PFOAs, which is called perfluorooctanoic acid. Now that's a mouthful, but it shouldn't be a mouthful in your mouth. And it is if you're cooking on this nonstick cookware. And Plus One Medical Journal recently published a study showing people with more PFOAs in their blood are associated with a greater weight gain, especially women. So they actually have proof now. They took blood and said, all right, thin people don't have these PFOAs, but bigger people do, and we get them from the nonstick cookware, also the grease-resistant packaging in fast food restaurants. That's wild. So nonstick cookware is easily replaceable, right? I mean, there's, oh, yeah. there's plenty of other options from cast iron to stainless steel out there. And obviously, we can avoid fast food and fast food packaging. Um, you can also consider bringing Pyrex containers with you if you're going to have leftovers. Like there's, there's, uh, we, can, we can limit our exposure in that way. Any other common sense ways that we can limit our exposures to these obesogens? Yeah. When you um, see a plastic beverage container or even your water bottle, and if you look on the bottom and you see a number three or seven in the recycling code, stay away. That means it has BPA or phthalates, which is another plastic obesogen. So instead, you want to look for plastic containers with the recycling codes one, two, or five then it's safe. So don't go with with three or seven and never leave your plastic water bottles in the car, especially in this hot summer coming here, because that leaches it right into the water and you're drinking it. And that's been linked to breast cancer as well. So that's a quick tip. Follow the numbers. Obesogen is also pesticides. That's an obesogen. So you want to avoid pesticides. Not always can you find it on the label, but there's a PLU code. It's called the price lookup code. If it starts with a nine, it's organic pesticide free. If it starts with an eight, it's GMO. So the saying I use is eight isn't great, but nine is fine. Okay. I love the mnemonic. That's excellent. Yeah. So those are some quick quick little tips you can do. Phthalates, I am familiar with uh, from looking at body products, like that primarily, like I know that they're hormone disrupting chemicals. And so it's the kind of thing where like one of the things that is typically an indicator of phthalates is fragrance or parfum. And so that's one of those things that people don't necessarily think about, but it is something that we are consuming. If we're putting it on our bodies, it's going into our bodies. And it's uh, true. uh, And and something else people don't realize, phthalates are also in plastic your shower curtains commonly use phthalates. So you want to get, so imagine this, you exercise, you eat right, you do acupuncture, you're this health nut and you take the shower and these phthalates gets hit by this hot water, gets on your face, you breathe it in and you're having a weight problem. There you go. Your shower curtain can be making you fat. So buy phthalate free shower curtains. They're cheap. They're on Amazon. You go bed, bath and beyond. 
get those shower curtains with this phthalates out of there. They're making you fat. I've seen on cans BPA free touted as as a, a claim. And I know that those have also been called into question as to whether or not they are hormone disrupting. What's your take on that? Is that any yeah. safer? You're talking about when it says BPA free again. Yeah. Yeah. I still would look for the code because that recycling code is pretty mandated. Anybody can throw anything free on the label, organic use, all naturals overused. You know, you can get an all natural 100% fruit juice and you buy it and look on the back. It'll say this product only contains 8% juice. How can they get away with that? Because the 100% of that 8% is juice. (laughs) <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so there's a little word game. So when it comes to that, I would... <laughs> yeah, yeah, got it. So, so just making sure that you're looking for that recycling code, avoiding the three and the seven. Yeah. Or you can, you know, use, you know, eco-friendly alternatives to plastic bottles. They got refillable glass, porcelain, stainless steel containers, yeah. particularly for hot foods and liquids. So there's ways we just got to not be so trusting. We got to really play detective and say, you know, I got to make this next step. It's not all about eating healthy food. It's other things, even the products around the food and wrapped around the food. And that's actually, I think, one of the reasons that I think so many people have a problem with gluten and wheat products specifically is the glyphosate that's sprayed on it before harvesting, um, which is, you know, glyphosate is tremendously disruptive to gut flora and therefore uh, can wreak havoc on our digestive system. And we can't maintain a healthy weight or a healthy body if we aren't digesting well. It's very true. I think a lot of the food sensitivities are a result of that as well. And it's, you know, if you think about it, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were fine eating certain foods and now everybody's got a sensitivity. Now what happened? Food didn't change. It was the stuff that's thrown on the food and how the food's grown and processed. You know, so many people say, eat like a caveman, paleo. No, eat like a gorilla, vegan. I say, eat like your great grandparents. Mm -hmm. They were healthier. They were 3% overweight. So people say, oh, I'm just overweight because my uh, uh, DNA. I go, well, you're wrong because you can't blame your genes on why you can't fit into your genes because your great grandma, there was a 3% chance she was overweight. Today, it's a 70% chance. (laughs) So that's the difference. If you look at these old pictures from the early 1900s, you know, the black and white ones, you'll notice you couldn't find hardly anybody that's overweight. Now look at a family portrait. It's hard to find somebody that's yeah. thin. <laughs> well, and, and I think part of that is is the change in culture and the, the prevalence of cheap food. You know, like we weren't surrounded by uh, 24-7 marketing of fast food, of cheap food, of things exactly. that, that are, are utterly un- undernourishing and yep. know, contributing to that overweight but undernourished yep. phenomenon. They didn't eat the processed foods or the chemicals yeah. and these, right. you know, these TV dinner, they ate fresh so, and, and they were health and cancer. Was I mean, you can just trace back. So forget the uh, paleo diet. Let's. I'm going to do a book called the Great Grandma Diet. Yeah. <laughs> I, Michael Pollan has that as one of his food rules: is don't eat anything that your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's so true. I think it's a good guideline. So I just brought up gluten and and grains. Let's go there next. Do you feel like most people should be avoiding gluten? How about the difference between whole grains versus flour products? Yeah. Well, you know, gluten, it's been eaten for three and a half million years, not for 10,000 years, like some experts are saying, including many that I interview, but science proves that wrong. They have actually found gluten from wheat and barley in the teeth of our ancestors. And according to research conducted by the University of Utah, 40% of our ancestors diet was gluten. So we've been digesting wheat and gluten for millions of years with no problems. We have the microbes in our mouth, stomach, colon designed to break down gluten why all of a sudden in the past 10, 15 years has gluten been deemed poisonous? As I said, it's not the food that's to blame. It's the chemicals we're exposed to in our food, around our food. And even like we mentioned, the cookware that's preparing our food on, that's causing this gluten and other food sensitivity issues. It's also from the pesticides and the wheat, the antibiotics inside our animals we consume. So all of this disrupt our healthy gut microbiomes. That's creating this immune response. Now, people suffering from celiac disease need to avoid gluten. That's a true allergy. Approximately 2.4 million have celiac. Then there's the estimated 5 million people that have gluten sensitivity. How can you tell if you have a gluten sensitivity? Well, you know, if you eat, eat it, you feel sick and busy and you can't sleep and you have a reaction, you're in that small group. But for 90% of us, that's most of us listening, completely boycotting gluten is absolutely not necessary. And doing so is really detrimental to your good health. The truth is whole grains, 
have many health benefits, including reduce your risk of stroke, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, aids in healthy weight control, promotes good bacteria in the gut, and it contains phenolic acids, an antioxidant with cancer-inhibiting properties. So in my book, I list, I list dozens of studies. I got to just share one comes to mind. In May of 2017, last year, the British Medical Journal published research conducted by Harvard School of Public Health. They analyzed over 100,000 subjects for 25 years. That's a huge study. They found participants with the highest intake of gluten-containing grains had significantly lower rates of heart disease than those with the lowest consumption of gluten. And there was one great one by the World Health Organization announced that daily consumption of whole grains containing gluten reduces colorectal cancer by 17%. So studies go on and on and on and on. We can't get rid of these great studies by having, when, you know, following one guy wrote a book, stay away from gluten and everybody's jumping on the gluten bandwagon. So my opinion is it's some people they eat it. Friedman, what are you talking about? I eat it. I feel bad. You're right. You feel bad, but don't blame the gluten. You're blaming your microbiome because they can't digest it. Focus on that. Don't go after the smoke. Look at the fire. What's causing the smoke signal? So in your opinion, if someone is, does have an issue with gluten, it could be fixed by strengthening the digestive capacity? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's with other sensitivities too. The place where I get caught up is that, are you familiar with the, the study that um, I hear Tom O'Brien cite it frequently, that gluten is a small intestine lining irritant in 100% of humans, but it's okay because the small intestine lining grows back every three days. And so it's like, it's no problem. It's just that, you know, our body's continually having to repair itself, but that at some point there's a hole in the cheesecloth and we can't repair from that. And then from then we, you know, we get leaky gut and et cetera. You familiar with that? What do you think about that? I think leaky gut is an issue, but it's, it's like, all right, so leaky gut is causing us to have a problem with gluten. Do we stay off gluten or do we say what's causing the leaky gut? See, that's the point. All these people saying get off gluten. Well, what's next? There's going to be another something we can get off next year. And the year after that, pretty soon we're going to be cutting. No, why would you have to cut down food that you could eat 10 years ago with no problem? People that eat gluten now, it bothered you now, but did it bother you 10, 15 years ago, 20 years? No. Did you parents have a problem with it. No, we've been digesting it for all these. What's happening is these years and years and years are being bombarded with so many chemicals. Even our water, our tap water is loaded with these chemicals that wreak havoc on our microbiomes. And I think the future is going to really show us that pretty much everything's linked to the microbiomes, including the stay off gluten fad that people are pushing. I'm definitely in the camp that there's a huge difference between a whole grain and a flour product. And right. a, lot of, a lot of people, when they go gluten-free, only to substitute gluten-containing processed food for gluten-free processed food actually gain weight and their health gets even worse. Oh, exactly. So yeah. It's the kind of thing where, like, where I feel like there's no reason that people need grains to be healthy. But if you want to be eating grains it behooves us to eat the things that we can digest. And that really like from a Chinese medicine standpoint, we think about like gluten literally has the root word of glue. It's going to be very congealing and very building to the body, therefore promoting of weight gain, as opposed to something like a grain that is non-glutinous, which is going to be less what we call dampening in Chinese medicine. Right. So therefore, usually more easily digested and, um, and therefore for a lot of people, a better choice if weight loss is a concern. Yeah. And you make a, a good point with the, uh, you know, people that go with the gluten-free stuff and they're gaining weight because it's like jumping from the, the pot into the kettle. I have friends that are vegans and they're overweight. And you say, how can they be overweight? Some of the biggest people I know are vegans because they're eating this processed junk and it's not animals, but it's still junk. It's the sugar, it's the wheat, it's the flour, it's the spaghetti, it's the pizza. It may not have meat on it, but it's still, it's still fattening. It's still not good for you. Oh yeah, the de I definitely did the carbitarian version of of vegetarian when I was in high school and I was like right. early on my journey and you know that just because you're avoiding certain things doesn't mean you're including the right stuff. So, I'm curious if I, like for for people who do eat meat, are there better choices and worse choices? What and 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 also, yeah, so I'd I'd like to talk a little bit about specific meats like pork and beef. Um, in your book, I know you mentioned pigs don't sweat and that if a snake bites a pig, the snake is more likely to die. So like, I'd yeah. like to hear more about that. Um, and I'd also like to help debunk the cholesterol myth. So uh, let's, let's talk about the meat section. Yeah. Well, interesting. You know, there's no wives tale out there sweating like a pig. We've heard people being told that. Well, actually, that couldn't be further from the truth because 
pigs don't sweat. And what that can do is lead to toxins remaining inside their body and ultimately ingested by humans that eat them. In fact, some pig's outer fat layer is so thick and filled with toxins, if a rattlesnake bites a pig, the snake is more likely to die than the pig. That's (laughs) disturbing. (laughs) Yes, but knowing that, I'm not a fan of eating pork, but if it's something you choose to eat, go for the leanest, less fattening and healthy option, which is the pork loin. The center portion sold as a center loin is the best option with the second best being the tenderloin and make sure, of course, it's grass fed or free range. If you're a ham lover and you love it, don't recommend it. But in my book, I always say it's not my way, the highway. I kind of show you the facts and the science, the instincts. But if you want to eat it, make sure it's baked. And prior to baking your ham, make linear slices on the meat and place it on a meat rack. And that allows the excess fat to drip away. The key is get rid of that fat and stay away from smoked pork because manufacturers use something called artificial smoke flavoring. It's called liquid smoke. It causes adverse health effects on the liver and kidneys. Interesting. Interesting. So that's it. And then with the either the beef, you want to mention that? The big thing. Yes. And, and I looked at every good, bad, and the ugly of every single meat group. And we looked at the science, the instincts, and the biology. Are we designed to eat it? What's your instincts tell you? And what is the true unbiased science choice? And I say unbiased because bias is spelled B U Y A S E D. So you want to make sure it's not <laughs> paid for. And a lot of the beef studies out there, in fact, majority of them, paid for by the cattle industry. So you can't- you Shocking. Can't, that's yeah, just you shocking. can't use that. So, you know, so interesting, you know, people think you got to eat meat for protein and strength. And of course, you know, there's many professional athletes and Olympic gold medalists that are vegetarians. So how can they get their speed and agility? But when you look at science, four years ago, the National Academy of Sciences shared a major discovery and it didn't make the news. You know why? Cows rule when it comes to media, and you didn't hear about this. It's the biggest money maker America has is the cattle industry. But there was a unique sugar that is called NEU5GC. It's a molecule found abundance in cows, but it's not found in humans. And when we eat this sugar, it triggers an immune response, and our body attacks it. This leads to chronic inflammation, has been linked to colon cancer. And among all victims of cancer, colon cancer is the second leading cause of death. So the more red meat you eat, the more likely you are to get colon cancer. The most authoritative report on colon cancer risk to date was published by the World Cancer Research Fund. They concluded 50% of colon cancer could be prevented if people ate less red meat. So we we knew one time smoking caused cancer. We didn't know why. And then scientists said, oh, it's the nicotine. Well, now we know that beef has been linked to colon cancer. Now we know why it's this NEU5GC molecule. Red meat's very hard to digest because humans have longer intestines compared to carnivores. The remnants of meat can remain in the colon longer leading to putrefaction, which can turn into ammonia and a waste product called uric acid. And that acid destroys the intestinal flora, which we talked about. And when uric acid remains stagnant in the colon for too long, it gets absorbed back in the bloodstream. That's the leaky gut, which can contribute to arthritis, hypertension, increased risk of type 2 diabetes. So compared to other animal foods, red meat is the most difficult to digest. Fish takes 30 minutes to digest. Chicken takes 90 minutes. And red meat, ready? Five hours. And if you don't eat enough fiber, it can cling to the intestinal walls for weeks. So you can, and another thing, the number one reason people get the Heimlich maneuver, the number one, choking on a piece of beef. Choking on a piece of beef, on like a a ridiculously large piece of beef as well. Yeah, you can't (laughs) digest it. But my point is, so so I know people love it, but but, you know, and and if you do eat meat, do it in, in small amounts, you know, once, twice a month, fine. But man, these people that eat beef and bacon every single day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's see if they're around in 10, 15 years to share how great that diet is and that they're doing now. Yeah, you'll lose weight, but are you going to lose your life? That's the question. We were talking a little bit before I pressed record about some of the research that you've done into fish and how it's actually much safer than we think. I'd love to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, fish is the most healthiest food you can eat. In addition to being a great source of protein, fish gives you those omega-3 fatty acids. It's great for fighting inflammation, which, of course, we all agree is the underlying cause of chronic diseases like Alzheimer's and heart disease and so forth. But when I mention fish to my patients, they say, oh, no, I don't want the mercury. So I eat fish, and I've heard all about the mercury, and I'm like, you know, is there such thing? as Should I not be eating fish? And I researched this. I was trying to find out, let's see if, if, if there's some people that have been toxic from fish or they can't think or they've got Alzheimer's, something. And the problem is, is the oceans are not the mercury-laden cesspools we've been led to believe. And food sanity, I debunk it. And I explored cultures around the world that eat fish daily, sometimes three times a day, and their blood tests show no mercury toxicity. They're the epitome of good health. 
pregnant females, we've been told, oh, avoid certain fish because it's bad for the fetus. Well, there's simply no credible research to support this. I looked. In fact, evidence shows quite the opposite. Cultures where pregnant females eat a dietary primary fish, like mostly tuna, have healthier children with higher IQ scores than mothers avoiding fish. So here's why mercury is not an issue. Of course, mercury is found in everything from high fructose corn syrup to beef to cattle to mushrooms. Why are fish getting picked on? They become the redheaded stepchild of mercury. <laughs> and when you know we're talking about 0.6 parts per million in fish. That's the high end. Fillings have 27 parts per million. I mean, but you don't hear anything bad on the FDA sites about fillings, so that's another topic. But here's why mercury in fish is not a concern. Mercury cannot cause harm unless it occurs in extremely high enough amounts to inhibit selenium-dependent enzymes, which naturally protect the cells of the brain. So in other words, if fish contains more selenium than mercury, it cancels out the mercury that is absorbed by the body. So in my book, I have a list of 18 of the most commonly eaten fish, all of them except for the mako shark, has more selenium than mercury. So play it safe, folks. If you're at a restaurant, you see mako shark on the menu, don't order it. <laughs> but the other wild-caught fish are good for you and won't cause mercury poisoning. Naturally derived mercury found in fish is not the health issue we've been led to believe. You just said the words wild caught, which was just yes. going to be my follow up question. Is that like, is that the difference between wild caught fish versus farmed fish? And would you consider farmed fish something that is also safer to be avoided? No, farm fish, it's a farm, farm fish should be stay away from. And what's sad is salmon is the most commonly eaten fish, and 90% of the salmon sold is farm raised. And people don't realize that that's not healthy. They even see the word farm and they go, oh, that means it's good because we're inbred to think if it's from the farm, it means good. And, you know, they have concentrations of PCBs. They're higher in farm-raised fish because it accumulates in the fat. And that's cancerous. And that grows in the fat tissue. And obese farm-raised salmon are a haven for these toxic chemicals. So just like a professional marathon swimmer would have less fat on his body, so do wild-caught salmon. So that's the key. Trust your eyes. If you see a fish that's salmon that has fat between the muscle, it's farm-raised. Wild-caught salmon don't have fat. They're professional swimmers. They go upstream. They shouldn't be fat. And that's where the toxins grow, just like the pork. So stay away from the fat. That's why farm-raised is so bad. And the other thing is farm-raised salmon are gray. Nobody would eat gray salmon. We want to see a pink color. So what do they do? They dye it with pellets. They feed these fish coloring. And the farmer picks what color he wants to feed the fish. So you're eating this dye like you're painting Benjamin Moore. Oh, let's paint our fish. So farm-raised is not the way to go. The reason that they're not pink and orange is because they don't eat krill if they're farm raised. Out in the wild, they eat krill, which gives them that natural pink and orange color. Isn't it the omega fatty acids that are the healthy part of salmon? Yes, the omega, the omega fatty acids are healthy, but, and also, guess where they get that from? Krill. Krill, krill right, oil. Yeah, yeah. And that's my favorite. You know, people say you should do fish oil supplements. That gets rancid. Even I had Dr. Barry Sears on my show. He's like the founder of the omega, and he said 90% of all Fish oil is rancid and rotten. He says it's, he called it what he called the sewage from the sea. So if you go with krill oil, you're still getting the omegas, but you're getting it from the sources where fish get their omegas. So skip the middleman, go with the krill, and that doesn't get rancid. Nice. Let's go through the grocery store. Okay, so we've gone we've gone through the meat section. We've gone through the grains. Um, anything in the vegetable kingdom that we really need to stay away from, in your opinion? Well, the big thing with, with vegetables, you know, it's, and again, I did do good, bad, the ugly, and I did have a whole chapter as the bad on vegetables. And of course, you know, you want to avoid the, the pesticides, which is a big thing. And, you know, you can memorize the dirty dozen, which is the fruits and the vegetables that you want to eat organic. But an easy way to remember it is if you can get your finger fingernail and you could stick it through the skin, that means the pesticides can get into the skin. So the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen, um, an excellent resource for us to keep in mind when choosing our vegetables, which of course should be the mainstay of our diets. But if you don't want to memorize that, if you can put your fingernail through the skin, get it organic because if you can put your fingernail through the skin easily, pesticides, pesticides. can get in there. So strawberries, blueberries, apples, pears, not so much the case when you deal with things like avocado right. or, or eggplants so much that are pineapples because that's not going to penetrate as deeply. Great, great way to remember that. Let's talk a little bit about salt. What kinds of salt would you say 
uh, should be avoided versus like, I know that there's a big difference between salt that's added, uh, for example, by a restaurant that can be inflammatory versus natural sea salt or rock salt um, with minerals in it. What's the difference? Yeah, what's interesting is in, in my book, I recommend the no white diet, which is if it's white, keep it out of sight. And it's pretty much salts in there and sugar and flour. And that's the process, the the, the refined uh, stuff that we pretty much eat on a daily basis. But when you're looking at salt, it's interesting because I get so many experts saying salt's bad for you, cause high cholesterol, causes cancer, causes bloating. Folks, we're 70% salt water. When we cry, our tears are salty. We're made out of salt. How can salt be bad for us? If we took the water out of your body and put it into an aquarium, it would sustain sea life. We're almost identical in salt as the ocean. So salt is good for us. We need it, but the right kind, the white processed stuff is stripped of over 80 essential minerals. So what white salt does, table salt, makes you hungry. It does cause the bloating. It does lead to, to the heart disease if you do too much of it because it's empty and it makes you hungry. It makes you crave carbs. It makes you crave sugar. You know who knows this? Movie theaters. That's why they salt the popcorn. They know you're coming back because you want some jujubes and you want a soda. Fast food restaurants salt their food because they know you're going to come back for another hamburger. So the best kind of salt is, as you mentioned, the unprocessed, which would be the black Hawaiian volcanic salt. That's my favorite. Redmond sea salt from Utah or you can go pink Himalayan, these all are from nature and they feed our cells with minerals and nutrients. They make us full and they saturate our cells and they're good for us. They're minerals, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, they're all in there. I love the Himalayan pink rock salt. Yeah, It's good stuff. It's a staple at our house. So we've made it all the way around the the grocery store. Um, I don't know that we've talked about eggs too much at this point. Um, can we get into that a little bit? There's um, they, that was a subject of much debate about whether or not they are these cholesterol bombs or that are going to give us heart disease and kill us, or whether they are in fact a healthy source of protein. What's your take? Yeah, for oh, it was like it was like two or three decades that cardiologists and everyone was saying get off of your eggs if you've got heart disease, and and it was the the big thing. Restaurants were selling it, and then they said, oh the white's fine. Let's just do white. Remember that when the egg whites were every, everywhere and they got rid of the yolk because it was bad. And then scientists said, wait a minute, the yolk contains lecithin and choline, which actually lowers cholesterol. It's okay now. And so science shows that there's not one study, not one showing that eating eggs increases your cholesterol. In fact, Harvard did a study, it was like a 14-year study, and they found there was not one scientific evidence. In fact, opposite happened. So to answer your question, eggs are phenomenal. I eat them sometimes three, four times a week. And you, of course, you want to go organic, you want to do grass fed and so forth. But eggs are the perfect multivitamin. It has everything the body needs. It's, there's nothing better than the egg. And in fact, I interviewed uh, Bill Pearl, was it, I think it was named. No, it was Lee Haney. I knew it. Okay, Lee Haney, Mr. Olympia eight times. And I mentioned him in my book, he had he consumed 12 eggs per day. And back then I was into bodybuilding. This is before I researched. I says, aren't you worried about the egg yolk? He says, no, that's like the perfect part of the egg. And he says his cholesterol is perfect. And he said, if anybody can show me how eggs cause high cholesterol, he'll pay him five grand. And it was like, he was you know, kidding, but it's true. You don't get high, high cholesterol from that. And we're talking 12 a day. I don't do that. I do two a day. He does 12 and he's never had high cholesterol problem. And this is the epitome of fitness and, you know, lean muscle. Even though that eggs contain cholesterol, dietary cholesterol is different than cholesterol that comes from food, yes? Exactly, yeah. And, you know, of course, you want to go USDA certified on the label. You you know, there are eggs that are not good for you, and there's stuff you don't want the growth hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, and so forth. So you've still got to play detective work. And again, you know, eat eggs like your great-grandma did. She ate great eggs. We need to try to get as close to that as possible. Awesome. One last thing I wanted to ask you before we close this interview today, and that is your point that counting calories makes you gain weight. Love to hear more about that because I I happen to I happen to agree that counting calories is of, as I think JJ Virgin put it, that we are not our body's not a math problem. That like food food is it's, it's a chemistry lab, not a math math equation. True, true. You know, fad diets, they come and go. And we've talked about the most popular diet by far of the last century is definitely calorie counting. It's become the standard methodology for people wanting to lose weight. Here's the problem. 
calorie count diet can put your body into a famine mode that causes you to gain back your original weight and sometimes even more. And that's why they call them yo-yo diets. Mm -hmm. So by definition, let's say what a calorie is. It's a, it's a calorie is a measurement of heat. It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water through one degree Celsius. So a calorie by definition is heat. If heat caused weight gain, everybody living at the Southern hemisphere would be obese, but actually science shows they're leaner. And interesting, when I was researching my book, Food Sanity, the biggest calorie counting organization in the world is called Weight Watchers. And I found an interesting quote from David Kershaw, it was 2011 in Time Magazine, the CEO of Weight Watchers told Time, quote, calorie counting has become unhelpful when we have a 100 calorie apple in one hand and a 100 calorie pack of cookies in the other to view them as the same makes no sense. So for Weight Watchers to make a statement like that really puts into perspective the lack of success that calorie counting alone has when it comes to helping you lose weight and keeping it off. Calorie counting simply doesn't work. It also means, as you mentioned, as JJ Virgin said, you have to be a mathematician that takes the enjoyment out of eating. So if you eat the right wholesome foods, you don't have to count calories. So I believe don't count calories, make your calories count. Excellent. And the best way to do that, eating real whole foods that our great grandparents would recognize. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I don't care if you had 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 calories of broccoli, if you can stomach that, you're not going to be obese. Right it on. just doesn't happen. <laughs> really true. Uh, David Friedman, if people want, are interested in continuing to connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah. For information about uh, Food Sanity, you go to foodsanity.com. And I could not fit recipes in my book. So I'm offering 92-page ebook called Healthy Eating. It's got 30 recipes for free. So you can go download that right there. Just click it, download the uh, PDF. And for more information about me, you can go to drdavidfriedman.com. And you can see my videos, audios, blog posts, and follow me on uh, social media. You got the information there. It's uh, drdavidfriedman.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining me today. That was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to brodywelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.